Before we jump ahead and get into the nitty gritty around how to do a risk assessment, it's vital that we understand the theory behind hazards and risk and the subtle difference between the two. Once we've established that, we'll move on to look at the what, why and when of risk assessment, which will set us up nicely to go through to the five steps of risk assessment that we'll look at in good detail. So let's get started with this module on understanding hazard and risk by first asking the question, what is a hazard? In this section, we're going to make sure that you fully grasp the concepts of hazard and risk. The two terms are often confused in health and safety, so it's critical that you firstly understand the concept of hazards first before you can consider doing a risk assessment. So naturally, we're going to look at hazards first. After that, we'll start to introduce the concept of risk assessment before digging into the detail of how to actually carry one out. So it's time to go and get started with this first section where we ask, what is a hazard? The first thing we need to do is to get to grips with the basic definition of a hazard. The most simple, common shared definition of a hazard is that it's something with the potential to cause harm. And when we say potential to cause harm, we mean it could be anything that has the ability under certain circumstances to cause harm, in other words, injury or illness to a person. Now that we've established what a hazard is, we need to ask the more difficult question. That is, which hazards should you be concerned about in the workplace? That's a more difficult question to answer, but to help us here, let's look at some common workplace hazards that are often associated with injury or illness at work. The first one we're going to mention is responsible for 31% of all workplace non-fatal injuries in Great Britain. Can you guess what that might be? Well, it's slips and trips. So you might have heard of the concept or the notion of slips, trips and falls, something that maybe a health and safety representative or someone within your workplace, a manager of some description has talked about uh, and talked about avoiding. That's because it's responsible for over 30% of injuries within the workplace and just is something that is often forgotten about and often not something, again, you would see very easily within the workplace unless you're looking out for it. The second one I'm going to highlight here is one of the major causes of both fatalities and severe injuries across Great Britain to this day, and that is working at height. So any work from a raised platform or raised work area that has the potential to cause harm should a fall occur. That could be scaffolds, roofs, ladders, anything of that nature. And it's something really to look out for, whether working directly within your business or if you're bringing someone in to carry out work. The third example of a common workplace hazard or set of hazards includes things like cranes, forklifts, mobile elevated platforms. Can you have a guess as to what that might be? I'll give you a second. Well, it's lifting operations. And lifting operations, as you can imagine, includes quite a lot, a wide spectrum of different activities and operations within the workplace environment. So that's something that is well controlled by regulations, but it's also something that carries a high risk and something that you should look out for within your workplace. The next common set of workplace hazards that I want to mention is something that is pretty much all around us, and that is workplace plant and equipment. So when we think about hazards associated with workplace plant and equipment, what are we thinking about? Well, there's usually a legal obligation, and certainly there is in the UK, that the employer supplies equipment that is suitable for its intended use, but also that it's maintained in a safe condition. And usually this means that it's maintained and serviced in a way that aligns with the manufacturer's guidelines. So if you ask this question within the workplace context, Usually there will be a lot of information and equipment that you can look at to ensure that things are being done right. 
Something that's responsible for a high proportion of severe injuries and fatalities within the workplace is being struck by a moving object or a vehicle. So workplace transport is another area of high concern when it comes to hazards and something again that you should really be aware of and look out for within your workplace operations. So that was just some of the typical hazards that commonly cause injury or illness in the workplace, but we're only really scratching the surface. But don't worry, we will look further at ways that you can identify the relevant hazards within your business as we progress through the course. But for now, the next thing we need to do is begin to understand how hazards relate to risk. I've lost count of the amount of times as a health and safety professional I've heard the terms hazard and risk be used in the wrong way, misunderstood or just really poorly applied. So I want to make sure that we get this cleared up before we move forward into doing a risk assessment. Now that we've looked at hazards, let's understand how that relates to risk. So if a hazard is something with the potential to cause harm, what then is a risk? Well, risk is the chance of that harm actually being caused. In other words, it's the likelihood or chance that someone may suffer injury or illness due to an existing hazard. Something to note is that when we do a risk assessment later in the course, we need to consider two aspects of risk. To determine the level of risk, we'll need to consider first the likelihood or the chance of the harm occurring, and secondly, the severity or the degree of harm that would be caused. Let's look at a simple example of the difference between hazard and risk, just to put this into context. In our example, the water cooler on the factory floor has started leaking. As you can see in the animation, this has created a puddle on the floor which is now presenting a slip hazard. So the hazard is created. If we leave things as they are at the moment and don't do anything to remove or control this hazard, there is going to be a heightened or significant risk that someone could slip and injure themselves. On the other hand, if we identify the hazard and decide that it justifies putting some simple control measures in place, such as a barrier, as you can see, the chances then of someone coming to harm would be lessened. In other words, the level of risk has decreased. Hopefully you can see from our simple example that despite the fact that a hazard still may exist, if you do put control measures in place, the level of risk can be reduced. So that sets us up nicely to move on with how to do risk assessment. Okay, so now you're ready to go through the process of doing the five steps of risk assessment and you'll want somewhere to take some information down and that may be on a piece of paper, on your computer, on an Excel spreadsheet or if you have risk assessment software, for example, you may be able to use that to document what your findings are. So we'll assume you have something in place to make sure you take down all that important information. But the first thing you need to do then is to identify the hazards for this first step of identifying the key hazards within your workplace, we're going to give you 10 ways that you can go about it. Let's get started. The first way that we can identify hazards is a pretty obvious one, but at the same time, many times when we're going through the risk assessment process, people would just do it at a desk. But what we are advising here for the first step when you come to identifying hazards is to walk around to get out there into the workplace and look at the activities, the processes and the equipment that may cause injury or ill health to your employees. Regardless of what your role is, getting out there and taking a walk around is just a means to re-familiarize yourself with the workplace environment, to see what's going on, if there's any new things that have been brought in since the last time you've taken a really focused look. And that's a great way to start taking notes and establishing what may be a significant risk to your employees. The second way that you can identify hazards within the workplace is by taking the time to observe the work being done. So once you've taken your walk around and established where the risk or the hazards may exist in the first place, then you can start to focus spending your time watching processes and cycles of work taking place to see if there are indeed hazards that you may be presumed exist and taking more notes in detail on those. Depending on the hazards that you're actually dealing with at the specific work activities, you may want to use 
different people to do the job just to see if there's any variation in the risks or the hazards that are being presented because sometimes people will do jobs completely different from one person to the next so that's just something to bear in mind. The next point we want to make when it comes to identifying hazards is something that builds upon what we've already done in the first two methods that we're using going from walking around to observing the work and the reason we're doing it separately is because it's so important and each of them can be done exclusively of one another and that is to make sure that you're actively engaging with the workers who are carrying out the work and by that we mean approaching them letting them know what you're actually doing and asking them do they feel as if there are any hazards during the course of their work that are putting them at risk also you can ask them how they go through the process of their work so that you get a better understanding of how that work is done versus how you perceive it being done the next method that we would use to help identify hazards in areas prone to risk are looking at the accident and incident records within your workplace. So this gives you an opportunity to look at what in recent times may have caused a risk to an employee or in fact an injury or ill health. So what sort of information can you glean from these? Well firstly it gives you a focus for areas to look upon if there are recurring injuries or incidents of ill health and you can look to see if control measures from the outcomes of investigations have been put in place and also more than that you can engage again with the workers to ask them are they happy with the controls that have been put in place since incidents or accidents have occurred. The next tactic that you can use to identify those significant hazards within your business is to get the information from your sickness absence records. You may be thinking that all the information should be within your accident records but that isn't always the case. You may find that there are hidden risks or organisational factors that are influencing absence from work within your business and that of course is a risk and a hazard to your employees. By looking at the absence records you may be able to uncover some information that gives you even more direction towards where the significant hazards are within your business when it comes to ill health or injury amongst your workforce. You may be asking yourself why would I be interested in what goes on after hours but the simple reason is because normally heavy duty work or stuff that's disruptive to normal day to day operations within production environments is usually scheduled outside of that normal time space. So therefore it stands to reason that a lot of the high risk work may actually be conducted outside of normal working hours. So it's really important for you to understand if this happens and who manages it. Once you've liaised with those responsible for that after hours activity then you'll be able to decide whether those hazards are relevant to your risk assessment. The next one is a big one and that is making sure that you're looking at manufacturers guidance. Why is this important? Well when we boil it back to the legal premise around employers responsibilities within health and safety a lot of it really comes down to making sure that you're instructing your workers to follow the manufacturer's guidance. By ensuring that you have all the relevant information for your plant and equipment for your hazardous substances or chemicals across your site you'll be able to identify much easier the significant hazards that are presented by the activities that you actually carry out. One important point to remember here is to ensure that you have competent people or the relevant technical expertise to ensure that you're interpreting the instructions and information correctly. Once you have that in place you'll be in a strong position to take that information and put it into your risk assessment where appropriate. One of the areas we haven't touched on yet as a really good source of information is using your local regulator's guidance. Of course depending where it is in the world that you're operating from this may be really good or it might not be so useful but in the UK as an example the health and safety executive have a comprehensive website with a lot of documentation that's free for users to go along and look up their specific industry sector or work activity and you'll get guidance on what the key hazards to look out for and manage are so that's something to really be conscious of as well as industry standard guidance as well depending on what specific activity that you're doing may exist and that will give you a means of accessing what is deemed as best practice within a particular industry or again a particular work activity. 
Okay, so we've reached number 10 here on our ways to identify hazards. And this one is just simply tying in some of the things that we've already looked at. And that is just to take an overview with all the information that you've already collected and look at your servicing and maintenance regime for your equipment and everything that runs within your operations. The servicing and maintenance is a really key aspect of health and safety and any hazards that exist with your equipment are usually controlled through a servicing and maintenance regime of some kind. So it's a good idea to look at how that currently sits and that will then feed into your risk assessment and it will help you get a head start when it comes to identifying if you need to put extra control measures in. One thing I didn't mention when we looked at ways to identify hazards is the use of hazard symbols. When we think about hazardous substances or materials, you'll often find that there is a pictogram on them and there's a globally standardized system to help us interpret what type of harm to human health a particular substance or material could potentially do. So we'll supply you with some information around that that you can take on your hazard spotting walk and then you can take that information and put that into your risk assessment. For step two of going through the risk assessment process, what we want to do is identify who can be harmed and how. So how do we go about this? Well, primarily you will be thinking about your own employees when it comes to those who may be subject to harm, but what other groups may be at risk when you're carrying out your activities? Yes, this may primarily be your own employees, but there are other groups and depending on the context of your project or wherever it is that you're working or who you're working with, there will be other people that you have to consider and you may have to treat them slightly differently or put extra precautions in with your risk assessment. Let's take an example. If you think about a construction project that is taking place on a live hospital environment, if you were carrying out a risk assessment for that scenario, what other people other than the employees would you have to think about? Well, you would need to consider, of course, the patients in the hospital itself. Would there be any impact on those guys and their health? Also, you've got the staff who will be coming in and out of the hospital to try and carry out their normal work activities. Would you be affecting them? On top of that, you also have members of the general public coming to visit people in the hospital. As you can see, in certain environments and certain contexts, you may have a lot more people to think about other than your own workforce. When you're trying to determine who might be harmed and how they might be harmed as part of your risk assessment, you also want to be aware of anyone who may be more vulnerable to harm than the next person. So what are we thinking about here? There are certain groups of people that we think about as potentially more vulnerable than others. Can you think of who they might be? When thinking about people that might be more vulnerable, you may be thinking about people with medical conditions, people that are elderly, for example, young people, pregnant ladies, of course, which would be one that would have to be considered when exposing them to certain types of work or materials. The harm to the unborn baby must be considered as well, of course. And as well as that, you may have considerations that need to take place for specific disabilities as well. So that could be access, egress problems or other aspects of disability that would be specific to that individual. Once you've established who might be harmed and how they might be harmed from your work activities, it makes the process much easier later on when it comes to putting specific control measures in place to manage the risk. Earlier in the course we looked at the definition of a hazard, then we showed you some ways to identify hazards in the workplace. Now for a bit of fun, let's try some hazard spotting in a warehouse environment. How do we go about doing this activity? We recommend that you refer to the step-by-step -step supporting information that we'll provide a link to in the description. And also we strongly encourage you to use the editable risk assessment template that we'll also provide a link for, and you can download that um, as you're going through the process. Once you've completed this step, save your risk assessment template and we'll revisit the scenario later on in the course.
In steps one and two, we looked at first of all, how to identify the significant hazards within the scenario that you're looking at, followed by looking at who may be in danger and how they might be affected. Now we have to go on to figure out how bad the harm might be and how likely it is to happen. In other words, we're asking, what is the risk? And when we think back to what the definition of a risk is, it's the likelihood that someone will come to harm or suffer adverse health effects as a result of being exposed to a hazard. And we must remember that although a hazard may exist, it might not represent or present a risk to people or property. On the screen in just a second, you're going to see an example of a risk matrix. Let's have a look at it. Okay, so now you should see what the risk matrix looks like. And hopefully you can see as well that on one axis you have severity and on the other axis you have likelihood. And these two component parts are multiplied together to give you a risk score. Once you're able to assign a value to each likelihood and severity and multiply them together, then you will have a result that will represent the significance of the risk that exists. As shown on the matrix, for each of the elements, the number chosen represents the level of significance. It might be high, medium or low. If we're thinking about likelihood, just remember that we're asking the question, what are the chances of that outcome actually happening? And when we're thinking about severity, we're asking how bad is the outcome likely to be? In other words, how severe would the injury or illness be? The matrix that we're using here for this training is one of the most simple examples of a risk matrix that you might see, but it also is very effective. And it means that it's easy for you to get comfortable with the process of using such a matrix. And then also as well, it makes it easier for you to communicate the results of any risk assessment that you might do. Although you may see more complex or detailed versions of this around, often they're not actually necessary and they all work along the same principle. And with that in mind, it's important to note that the intention of a risk matrix isn't to give you a quantitative measure of the actual risk, but just to allow you to measure the perceived risk level and from that point you can prioritise your actions. Let's delve a bit deeper into each element and just reflect on what decisions we have to make when we're looking at each individual hazard or activity. First of all, we have to think about the likelihood. So again, what is the chance of the harm happening? We have to decide from levels one to three whether it's very likely, possible or unlikely. So if you take an example of one of the hazards that you've identified in your make-believe scenario or within your work environment, and just think about where that would sit accurately according to the reality that you found during your investigations looking at the hazards. Then we need to go on to severity. So we have to ask the question again, how severe or how bad is the outcome going to be in terms of the harm, whether that be an injury or ill health to a person? So our examples on this risk matrix would be, is it going to be likely that it's a major injury or fatality? Is it going to be a minor injury or on the lesser extent would it just be a trivial injury as the outcome of the hazard that you've identified hopefully again if you're thinking of your example it'll be easy to put it into the relative block and pick a number that you can put into your risk matrix that then can be multiplied against the likelihood to give us our level of risk another thing about the risk matrix which works really well from a visual point of view is using a traffic light system so that red, amber and green colour system that we're all probably very used to gives us an easy visual representation of where the high risks are so we can focus our attention towards them and take action appropriately. Okay, so hopefully you've got the grips with the concept around severity and likelihood combining together to give us our risk level. Now, if we apply this to a make-believe scenario, we want you to interpret what your perception of the risk level would be, and you can score the severity and the likelihood according to our risk matrix. So you'll see up on the screen now an example of a scenario within a workplace. 
As you can hopefully see in the photos on the screen right now, we have a forklift driver operating his vehicle in a warehouse type environment. It appears that the forklift driver is moving along or has been moving along with a pallet loaded onto the forks of the forklift and there is a pedestrian about to walk across his path. So what we want you to do is give us your opinion on how you would rate the severity of this scenario when it comes to the outcome of any accident that would occur in these circumstances. And secondly, we want you to look at the likelihood of it happening with all the things that you can see in the photo taken into account. Hopefully you have your answers jotted down on a piece of paper by now or on your computer and you can refer to them while we talk through this. So firstly, let's think about the severity. If a person was hit under these circumstances by the forklift as they appear to be in the photo, how severe would that outcome be? Well, in our opinion, the severity of this would be very high. It would be likely that either a major injury or even a fatality might be the outcome of this accident. And therefore, we would have to mark this as a number three on our risk matrix, so that's the highest level of severity for our matrix in this scenario. Did you agree? Second of all then, we need to ask, what are the chances of this event happening under the current circumstances? To be more specific, what is the likelihood of a collision between the pedestrian and the forklift? When we're trying to determine the likelihood within a scenario, we're really asking how well are the risks currently controlled? Unlike when you're looking at the severity of an outcome, which usually doesn't change too much, when you're thinking about likelihood, there's lots of factors at play that can influence the probability of something happening. In the scenario we're looking at, you might want to think of factors such as how easy is it for the person or the forklift to get into an area where there may be a collision. Also, is there anything that you can see that's been put in place to make it obvious to the forklift driver and or the pedestrian that there may be a risk of a collision in the area that they're both operating in? And third of all, what are the current behaviours of the operator of the forklift in this scenario? As you can see, the forklift operator is driving with the load on the forklift raised, which from the different angles you can see is clearly obscuring his view. And this behaviour in itself is obviously going to increase the risk of a collision. Going on the evidence that we've been given in this scenario, it looks like it would be reasonable to classify the likelihood of a collision between a pedestrian and a forklift as highly likely according to a risk matrix. Would you agree with this? Don't worry if you didn't agree with this outcome. We will go into more detail in the next step about evaluating risks and deciding when it's appropriate to add more control measures. Hopefully once we've been through that process, you'll gain more confidence in deciding what is likely. And also, we'll do an activity to come back to this scenario and identify where extra control measures might be beneficial. So, if we said that the severity is level 3, the highest level that we can get, and the likelihood is very likely, also number 3, the highest we can get, where does that land on our risk matrix? Hopefully you can see when we match up our severity rating of three, which is of course a major injury or worse, against a likelihood level of three and multiply the two together, that gives us a figure of nine, which on a risk matrix is the highest figure you can get. So in this scenario, we would really be asking as part of our risk assessment that more control measures are put in place because the likelihood of something bad happening is very high and that should be unacceptable within most businesses. So that brings us to the end of our short demonstration as to how you should go about using a risk matrix to assess risk for each of your hazards or activities. Once you've done that process, and maybe you've done it for multiple activities, it's then about evaluating the risk as it stands currently and asking, do you need more controls? So let's look into the detail about how we do that.
I just wanted to say quickly thanks a million for sticking with us here through this short video course on risk assessment for the workplace. We really appreciate you taking the time to join us on our channel here. As I said at the start, please like and subscribe and click that notification bell to hear about more content that we'll be posting up on the channel. And of course, if you do have any comments, put them down below and we'll get back to you. Don't forget as well, we do have the certificated full version of the course that you can use for your employees available at safety.com and we'll drop a link in the description for you to access that. Until next time, take care and thanks for visiting. All the best.